Hello and welcome to this um, online class on the 1867 um, Reform Act. This uh, topic is to some extent a continuation of topics that we've already examined on the um, demands of the working class to acquire the vote within Britain. As we run through these um, slides, um, it's important that you go to the uh, My City page and click on the link that says um, 1867 Reform Act um, sources, sometimes referred to as the Second Reform Act. And um, I'm going to make reference to some of these sources um, as we run through this um, Sway presentation. Now, just a quick um, summary of where the working class stood in terms of um, attempts to gain the vote over the course of the um, 19th um, century. I mean, I guess we could go further back to Tom Paine, we could go back to Thomas Muir, who campaigned for the vote um, in the kind of period just after the French Revolution. In terms of the 19th century, um, you know about the period 1815 to 1820, where we have this um, intense um, period of political radicalism. To some extent, it culminates with the Peter Lou massacre, which you can see in this image, where obviously working class people had demanded the, the vote and um, did not receive it. After 1820, we have the um, kind of government ensuring that there is limited working class rebellion or working class um, protest and um, the government passes the laws which make it very difficult for any campaigns to emerge. Then we get to the next phase which is the um, 1832 Reform Act and between 1830 and 1832 the working class had to some extent allied themselves with the middle classes in an attempt to um, get the vote for, for both of, of, of these sections of society. Um, the outcome of the 1832 Reform Act was one of betrayal for the working class, right? They did not receive the vote, even though their presence definitely helps the middle classes um, get the vote. But when Parliament passes the 1832 Reform Act, they truly believe that they have um, implemented legislation that will last for a long time. And the working class have been kept out of the voting system, and a respectable middle class who owns some form of property um, would... Um, hopefully, hopefully be the last time that there had to be any major reform. The working class also do not accept this and we get between 1838 and 1848 uh, a period in British history that we refer to the working class um, history of um, um, kind of 10 years of struggle for the vote that we call um, charters or the Chartist um, era. And there were, as you know, three petitions presented to Parliament in the hope that, and we're talking about you know, a large amount of signatures here, this is way beyond the amount of people who signed the um, petitions for the abolition of the slave trade, we're talking about 3 million votes at one stage um, in 1842. And these are working class people demanding the vote, some middle class people would have given their support. Um, on each occasion that a charter was presented to Parliament, Parliament um, rejected it, the votes weren't even close. So the working class were um, denied um, the vote during this period and sometimes they are moral force, i.e. the use of peaceful protests such as petitions, sometimes that was um, supplemented with what we call physical force or violence and that was seen during the plug plot, plot riots or it was seen during the Newport uprising uh, in 1839. The Chartist movement was very much a working class movement. It was really to some extent when working class consciousness fully developed, right? I know we can trace it back to the 1830 uh, period up until 1832, but here we've got working class organisation, we've got working class uh, newspapers, we've got working class um, education. This um, was a, um, a kind of full scale attempt by the British working class across the country, but especially in urban areas, to um, achieve the vote. And the middle classes less so, but the upper classes definitely were fearful of um, the working classes um, and that whole language of, of social class um, put fear into the, the kind of aristocracy who refused to obviously um, accept um, any change to the voting system. So we move on roughly 20 years and we get the Reform Act of 1867 which does lead to limited reform for the working class. Right? It actually brings in 700,000 new voters in Britain and the vast majority of them are your urban working class. I guess many of them are your kind of um, 
workers who have jobs, sometimes in factories, sometimes as skilled artisans, they are a key um, group by 1867 within British society. Why does the fear amongst the aristocracy disappear between 1848 and 1867? Well, it doesn't really. It's just that maybe the campaign for the workers to get the vote in 1867 or the period leading up to 1867 is slightly more, um, I guess, um, respectable in the Dreadful Commons and it's less class based or less class orientated as we're about to see. The figures whose faces you can't quite see because we've been blanked out in this um, slide are um, to your left. Uh, Gladstone, William Gladstone, and uh, to your right, Benjamin Disraeli. And these are the two individuals who are um, sometimes seen as being responsible for the passing of the 1867 Reform Act. Technically that is true because they are the men in Parliament, a bit like Wilberforce was the man in Parliament who was in the um, abolition of the slave trade um, campaign, but they only act because they feel that they have to act. Gladstone may be a bit more sincere than Disraeli, as we will, as we will see. So the question is, why? Why in 1867, when the answer was no in, in, previous, um, in previous years? I should say that there's another reform act in 1884, which brings in working class people from rural areas, so coal miners for example, and more likely to get the vote at that point. And then it's in the 20th century before everybody gets the vote, and obviously women um, as well. Now let's um, start off with a little bit of background. Um, this um, is often referred to as a leap in the dark, this decision to give working class men the vote. That was not a leap in the dark for the working class, that was a leap in the dark for the aristocracy, who did not like the idea of working class people now being the majority um, group of voters perhaps within society. Would uh, these working classes have a kind of unfair advantage by kind of holding the country to ransom if they were to vote along class lines? So, you know, we're very far away from the Labour Party, we're at least, you know, 40 years maybe away from the Labour Party's establishment. Um, but there was a fear that, you know, what, what, if these, what if these people started up their own political movement or political party? Um, and that would that would be a kind of, uh, you know, a real democratic change to, to Britain. This is limited democracy um, that we're seeing at this point. Um, now, the reason maybe why there is success in 1867 uh, it's because of what had went before. Chartism wasn't a complete failure. It was a failure in terms of the, the Chartist demands were never fulfilled um, during the lifetime of the Chartists. But those who were involved in Chartism didn't just disappear, right? They carried on, they fought on, they joined trade unions, and there was many trade unions that started to emerge in the 1850s and 60s. These were skilled craft trade unions. And I guess the view taken by some of the middle classes was these were respectable men who had joined these trade unions who saw themselves as being of a particular um, occupation or had a particular skill rather than being part of this mass known as the working class. So there is this what is sometimes referred to as an organisational bridge, the organisation, the way that Chartism was successfully um, set up across the country, the way that it coordinated itself, that continued into the kind of 1860s when a new attempt began to um, gain access to the vote. There was also greater links with the middle classes, which was never really the case with Chartism. Thomas Atwell, who was a key figure during the um, 1832 reform act period, does become an MP, and Atwell initially does support uh, Chartism, and he actually presents the petitions to Parliament and votes in favour of them, but he's kind of out there on his, his own. Um, things are a bit different by 1860s, um, and John Bright is one of these middle class MPs, who really tries to encourage Parliament to accept the working class as voters, but he takes a different approach, right? He emphasises um, the working class as not being kind of rabid uh, radicals who want to um, see everything through the kind of prism of social class. He sees them, or he tries to portray them, and the working class um, kind of committee members of the Reform League who are also also keen in the vote, they themselves present themselves in a way which is less class-based and more about character. And one of the kind of characteristics that is put forward is this idea that the middle class and the working class are the productive elements within society. The middle class who often have respectable jobs um, in the eyes of society, which would be your professional jobs, but also the middle classes who own factories, who own the, the means of production, who are incredibly wealthy. They see themselves as being capital, the, the kind of group that makes wealth within the country, but that wealth 
can only be made with the help of the working class. So if you take labour and capital, capital together, or working class and middle class and the kind of welfare elements of the middle class, then you have got the productive elements of society. And the aristocracy have got a bit of an issue here because they are not productive, right? They are uh, your leisure class and they are the ones who still maintain the majority of power within society. So you can see why the middle classes might quite like the idea of working class people getting the vote because it might shift power away from the aristocracy and closer to the middle classes because the working class are much more likely to support the, the middle classes than they are the, the working classes. So that is, um, that's one point to take into account. Working class men um, would also try to um, prove their, their character during this period and they could do so through, um, I guess, um, toning down the kind of language of, of social class. So one of the things that um, they can see in Source 1, this appeal to the non-electors, um, where that the working class had um, certain demands and they um, used, obviously the main demand being the right to vote, and they used language which I guess was seen as being less inflammatory. So in your own time you should read this um, Source 1, it comes from the Birmingham uh, Daily Post from 1859, it's known as the Appeal to Non-Electors, and the language used is much more conciliatory, right? Um, and you'll, you'll, you kind of see things like, you know, um, the, the working class are, um, you know, ba you know the, the, their behaviour is based on things like honour and dignity, and they are not um, in any kind of way um, even proclaiming that they would even return to things like physical force, you know, they are patriotic and hard-working um, individuals who are part of the nation. In fact, the very um, final kind of section, if you like, of the first page of this um, um, appeal to the non electors talks about the, the working class being discreet and of a sober character, right? So we're getting a different type of, of working class um, presented to Parliament um, and to the British public in general. Um, with this new campaign for the vote. So this is 1859, 10 years um, after Chartism has kind of um, disappeared. Now, I should say that it's a, it's a one thing trying to convince the middle classes, but trying to convince that the, the, the upper classes and aristocracy or the ruling class is, is different, right? The majority of the Liberal Party and the majority of the Tory Party are from aristocratic backgrounds and the vast majority of them have no desire for this type of reform, right? They struggle to even accept the middle classes back in the 1830s. One individual who was maybe more willing to accept reform was William Gladstone, who was, you know, by this point a very well established um, politician. He was keen on maybe giving respectable working men the vote, um, partly because of the factors that we've just spoke about and that you'll see in that source one, but also because he believed that the working class had proved themselves to be trustworthy. You could give them the vote and they would not vote purely based on the fact that they were hungry or that they were impoverished. They would um, maybe vote based on the fact that, you know, they had access to newspapers and they had access to libraries and they could make um, educated and intelligent decisions. And part of that mindset for Gladstone comes from what happens during the 1861-1865 um, um, Lancashire cotton famine, which we have spoken about um, in a previous um, online lesson. And because the working class during this period did not think about their own interests, they thought about the interests of what Lincoln was trying to do in the United States, which was to emancipate the slaves, or at least that was the impression that people had in Britain. And um, even though these workers were suffering because there was no cotton coming into Britain, they would have much preferred the war to be over. They wrote a letter to Lincoln saying, carry on with the war, what you're doing is the right thing, even if it does result in us being unemployed um, for longer until the war ends and then cotton can start to make its way back to factories in Manchester, for example. Glasgow was impressed by that. He makes a speech, right, you can see this in Source 2, and in this speech in Source 2, he makes direct reference to the um, Lancashire um, uh, cotton um, famine. And um, he, he basically is of the view that the working class displayed certain qualities uh, during this time, and they were qualities that he believed were um, um, ones that were, were kind of selfless. They were more interested in the sufferings of others than the suffering of the, themselves. So, Gladstone's motivations are partly to do with that, but also partly to do with social stability and political opportunism as well here. The working class would most likely thank um, the Liberal Party if the Liberal Party granted them the vote and therefore the Liberal Party would receive working class um, votes. I mean, that's 
ironically, the same thing that happens in the United States when um, Lincoln himself does emancipate the slaves. Um, for a long time, African Americans vote Republican um, in the United States because Lincoln obviously was the head of the Republican Party. Um, okay, so that's the kind of first um, factor um, to focus on. This idea that the working class had somehow proved that they were capable of, of voting. And that, that kind of background, a long term factor of context, um, is very important. Now, what actually does happen is, uh, and there's been a bit, there had been occasions in the 1850s and early 1860s to put forward reform bills, but within Parliament there wasn't pressure placed on parliamentarians to vote for it because outside, right, or what we call extra parliamentary support didn't really exist because there was a kind of 10 year low post chartism of very little campaigning for the vote, right? But by 1865, that had changed and the Reform League and the Reform Union and the man who had suffered union who you uh, referred to in Source 1, they, they're now present, right? They're making their voice heard outside of Parliament. So there's a bit more pressure on um, MPs. And um, Gladstone decides that maybe 1866 is the right time to put forward a vote for um, reform. Now, he does, and it's, it's defeated, right? The, the bill is not received well. And it's not just in, um, the Tory party who reject it, the Liberals reject it as well, right? Or some Liberals reject it. So there's not um, as if this is uh, purely par party-based. Um, the reason why I think most um, MPs rejected Gladstone's bill in 1866 was because of the old class prejudice, prejudices that existed. Um, and, and that's stated clearly by um, Robert Gascoigne Cecil in Source M3, right? So if you have a little um, read of um, Source 3, you get a language that is um, used, which basically argues that the working class are kind of intellectually inferior. They're from a lower um, class. If you um, give them the, the chance to, to vote, then um, not only is it going to kind of undermine democracy, but it's going to actually possibly, in the views of people like Gascoigne and Cecil, make um, democracy um, to some extent um, less likely in Britain, because here you would have the working class voting, but not paying taxes, right, because that still don't have a proper income tax at this point, and they'd be telling people who were paying taxes, i.e. the property owners, what they should be doing in Parliament, and, and, and people like um, Gascoigne and Cecil believed that this was uh, incredibly un unfair. Um, obviously, um, that that was the way they wanted things. They did not want working class people to have enough money to pay for property. Um, so there's a bit of a contradiction within what he's um, saying here. Um, so, Clastow's bill actually does um, fail. Tories and Liberals alike um, shoot it down. A statement made by a Liberal politician, Robert Lowe, was actually then taken by the Reform League and put onto flyers and put up in committee meetings to kind of um, inspire the working class to not give up the fight and this is a famous statement from Lowe where he says if you want venality, if you want ignorance, if you want drunk, uh, drunkenness and facility for being intimidated or if on the other hand you want impulsive, impulsive and unreflecting and violent people where do you look for them in the constituencies? Do you go at the top or do you go at the bottom? So he says it doesn't matter what way you look at it, give working class people the vote then there's going to be a problem for democracy. And um, this type of language is, is obviously not going to sit, sit well with progressives and it's not going to sit well with the, the working class. So the bill does fail um, because you know the Liberals don't get quite behind Gladstone and the Tories obviously led by Disraeli who you can see here don't get behind um, Gladstone for obvious reasons. But Disraeli is a again a kind of political opportunist. He's a little bit like Boris Johnson in, in some way. He didn't have a strong ideological outlook in life he just was interested perhaps in gaining power. And that's what you can see in this poster here, when Disraeli takes over, right? So the Gladstone government uh, falls after the period of the bill, the Tories form um, a new government, Disraeli is at the head of this government now. And um, Disraeli, um, who has never really been a friend of the working class, has been depicted in this um, cartoon as now being the new friend of the working man. And you see him walking here with on his back and um, uh, reform as one of his kind of priorities. Now why does Disraeli flip? He, just, he didn't vote for 1866 but all of a sudden in 1867 he's going to put through his own reform bill which actually could be even more radical 
He simply does so to one, um, steal a march on the liberal attempts to gain the working class vote, so again, working classes might thank the Tories, but there was also personal rivalry. Um, now on My City you can watch a documentary about Disraeli and Gladstone, and throughout their whole life they just disliked each other, and they came into each other's company again and again and again, and they, um, as, as the period moves on, as we move on in the 19th century, they took turns basically being Prime, prime Minister, and they kind of just hated each other. And there's definitely an element of um, an attempt by Disraeli to vote against Gladstone's bill just to spite him and then put his own through. Because if Disraeli then puts his own uh, bill through, can Gladstone reject it? It's, it's, it's not something that Gladstone can now do because he's just put forward an 1866 bill. He would seem like a real hypocrite if he did not pass the 1867 um, bill. Uh, now there's a little video clip that you can watch here which is um, really useful, I'm not going to show it um, here, you may want to watch it in your own time, but it does tell us about what Morris Cowling, the historian here in the third bullet point, talks about, which is high party politics. Why was the Reform Act passed? Was it to do with Gladstone and Disraeli, or what we call kind of high um, politics? Um, there are other historians who take different views, right, so you can see Briggs' view in the second bullet point, that it was this moral and political pressure from below that kind of um, almost enforced um, the government to act. That kind of would suggest that it works in 1867, but did not work in um, the Chartist era. There was um, um, actions from the working class, you can see this in um, bullet point four, where they did take to the streets. There was a, a, a bit of trouble, a bit of violence in, in Hyde, uh, Hyde Park um, in um, 1866, after the first bill from Gladstone had failed. Um, source 4 and Source um, 5 make, make reference to this. When workers took to the street, when they showed their agency that they were not willing to accept defeat, then the police had to come out. In fact, in Source 5, Annette Meyer's source, um, which comes from a book from 1999, The Growth of Democracy, she talks about the fact that a 100,000 crowd um, in May of 1867 um, couldn't be dispersed by 10,000 police. It just wasn't possible. So marches and demonstrations um, continued. And it looked like um, Disraeli had no choice, maybe even to put forward um, another um, bill. So, by the time we get, and you can see in this image, um, the Hyde Park um, situation, we have got um, a couple of different factors then. So you could say, well, Gladstone was partly responsible, Disraeli was partly responsible, working class character was responsible, or working class direct action in the streets um, was responsible for the passage of the, the 8067. Um, Reform Act. Um, the American kind of historian and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson um, of the kind of 19th century um, does make a statement about history. He says, "In analysing history, do not be too profound, for often the causes are often um, are quite superficial." superficial. And um, sometimes historians do fall into the trap of looking for factors that might not always be there. And in this instance, there's really motivations to pass the Reform Act do seem quite superficial. One-upmanship over Gladstone is incredibly superficial. And um, maybe we should we should bear that in mind. If these two personalities were not in Parliament, kind of um, fighting out against each other, maybe there wouldn't have been a Reform Act put to Parliament. So we should, we should bear that in mind that on occasion, personality uh, and characters um, can, um, play a, can play a key role. So, um, that is basically the, the story of the 1867 Reform Act, nice and short um, and sweet. A combination of factors is maybe the best way to, to think about it. Now, what about the consequences? Surely this is a, a positive um, development in British history, and I would say that it, it was, right? As I said, 700,000 extra um, voters um, was the, um, the outcome. The issue that was not necessarily addressed was known as the septennial Act, which was that Parliament um, would still sit for seven years. So there was a view that that had to be addressed. Um, so a government's a long time for a government to be in power. And there was another issue that wasn't addressed, and that was the Secret Ballot Act. Now, Gascoigne Cecil's views that I read out earlier on, um, although I don't agree with them, you probably yourself don't agree with them, um, it did make a point about the working classes perhaps being violent at the time of elections. 
Well, that had always been the case, right? That was, that was part of the kind of election tradition. It was always a bit of violence, it was always bribery, there was always corruption. But that was encouraged by the aristocracy, right? It was encouraged and um, by the middle classes. Getting people drunk before they voted was um, a tactic that was, that, that was used, right? And um, one of the things that um, we see post-1867 um, is, is some violence, but I think that would have happened irrespective of the working class being involved uh, in the voting process anyway, because what the Liberals did and what the Tories did was they basically paid and hired working class people anyway to intimidate um, in the, the run-up to elections. And that could be done because the vote was not secret. It was basically a show of hands more than anything else. Or you would walk to the front and you'd say, I'm going to vote for, or you'd put a ball in a jar and say, that's who I'm voting for. It was public, it was public knowledge as to who you voted for. So bribery was, 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 was fairly easy to achieve. You say, look, you're going to vote for me and I'm going to give you this. And the person, therefore, couldn't then go into the voting booth secretly and vote against that. You have to, um, therefore, try and overcome um, this, this major issue um, by changing the system. Now, the reason why Britain had always been opposed to the kind of secret ballot was because there was a sense that this was not a British thing. Hiding, secrecy, you know, people should be open about who they were voting. But the problem was, if you didn't have a secret ballot, the thing that was British was bribery and um, corruption. You can read in Source 6 a little example of electoral violence in, in Blackburn. And I guess, um, in, in the world, okay, somebody does die actually during this, this example. If you take the death out of it, they are quite vibrant um, affairs, elections. You know, everybody gets involved. Okay, it might be slightly chaotic, and there will be, as I mentioned, you know, people getting told who they're voting for, or people um, drinking too much and then kind of voting in a certain way. But it did allow the working classes to participate and allowed women to participate. And this is what the historians Joyce and Verdon try to make. They were saying once we get the 1867 Reform Act, once working class people are part of the election, as uh, so part of the electorate and can vote elections, and then once we have this 1872 secret ballot act, which you can read about in the link um, at the bottom, um, it becomes more it becomes a more sterile atmosphere at elections. Here you've got in this picture a police officer in the cor in the corner and men coming in respectively, getting their, their polling cars, going into the little booth, making their X, walking out. And it's all much more um, serene and calm and also therefore um, less violent. And this new conduct, if you like, that takes place um, was um, examined in the um, 1870 um, Select Committee Report on Parliamentary and Municipal Elections, which then leads to the 1872 um, Secret, um, Ballot Act. Secret Ballot Act. It does discipline the electoral process. Women are now completely out of the picture because they could turn up, they could participate in the kind of um, carnival atmosphere sometimes of the voting process that would take place outside and now that's now that's gone. If you think about how we vote in Britain uh, today, um, you go into a primary school or a church hall and it's a very relaxed, very calm, very quiet um, process and um, that really is the, the kind of long term product of this 1872 um, secret um, ballot act probably for the best, I would say. Okay, so that's it. Short and sweet um, lesson on um, the Second Reform Act, or the 1867 Reform Act, and the final lesson um, before um, your exam. Thank you.